Carrie, what's happening? Same old, same old, Steve. Nice to see you. It's been a while. It has been a while. I, I love this. You're, you're outside. You're, you're enjoying a cigar. It's, mm-hmm. it's the middle of the afternoon. It's, it's the work day and you're just chilling. Every day is uh, Saturday and every day is Monday. <clears throat> okay. I don't like that analogy. I like the Saturday part. It's the Monday part where you lost me. <laughs> I don't know. You own your own business. I work, I work every day. I prefer to work a little bit every day than uh, take time off and then have all my emails pile up. And so I work pretty much. I also don't sleep much. So like 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. I work every day. Good for you. Good for you. I I would say that's actually a pretty important trait for successful business owners to kind of develop a routine so that way you know you you wake up early and what what is it uh there there's a book i i have it in my list i haven't read it yet it's it's something along the lines of like successful business people accomplish all these great things before breakfast and uh, i don't know that's kind of bullshit i think there's there's a book by daniel pink yeah um about the science of timing I can't okay. remember the name of the book, but it says that there are three groups of people, early birds, um, you know, larks, something, I don't know, but early risers, there's people that are productive early in the morning, there's people that are high energy and productive like late night, and then there's everybody else. So once you figure out where your energy cycles come from, you know when to schedule the tasks that are either the most uh, prohibitively boring to you, where you need lots of energy to be able to do them. Okay. Or the tasks where you're like things that you enjoy doing that you can get into a good rhythm for. Like I am a morning person that yeah. I am my most creative in the morning. If I'm going to write blog posts, if I'm going to do any kind of like graphic design, which I'm not a huge fan of, but it gets thrown on my lap more often than I'd like. Like I'll do that first thing in the morning. I can't call anyone anyway. And then I'll make phone calls from about 9 a.m. until I run out of energy. And sometimes that's 10 a.m. And sometimes that'll be the end of the day. But when I like when I lose my rhythm, then I go on to other stuff that doesn't need like, hi, it's Carrie calling from Man of Sales Bros. How are you today? So uh, the book Win the Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing by Daniel Pink. I assume that's the one you're talking about. Yep. It looks like he has another one called The Power of Regret. Oh, that's brand new. I haven't read it yet. Yeah. It's on the list though. Well, I just added win to my list. Uh, the book I was thinking of is what the most successful people do before breakfast is. Oh, I was close. What if you don't eat breakfast? I think, I think the point is, um, like breakfast, I don't know, like breakfast time for like the traditional American we'll say. Right. So you, you think people wake up. People with jobs, right? They might wake up at, let's say, seven o'clock, they'll eat breakfast, they'll leave, they'll get to work by 8 30, right? Mm-hmm. So I guess what this is saying is, you know, the the people that are more successful are willing to work outside of the work hours kind of schedule. And I'm not a morning person, so I don't wake up at five and get all this stuff done. I'm a night owl. So I'm okay with staying up late and rocking out a bunch of work from like 8 p.m. to midnight and then waking up at seven o'clock or eight o'clock like I normally do. And, you know, that's, that's just my day. So I might, I might, uh, work for, you know, let's say eight to noon or, or 10 to three or something like that. And then spend the other time with my family. And then once it hits, you know, eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night, I'll sit back down at the desk and rock out some of the things that I, I know I can do because it's after hours and I'm not going to have a bunch of people bothering. I, uh, I removed the people bothering me part of, uh, work years ago. Eh, So that that sounds nice. Well, my phone, so. I had a real problem with social media and just getting distracted midday. Like I would pop onto LinkedIn to make a post or I'd go on Reddit. And before I knew it, my whole day was gone. 
and I wasn't doing anything useful or productive. Although we have gotten a decent amount of business over the years from all social media platforms. Sure. Um, I don't need to be the one doing that. So I eliminated all of that kind of noise from my life. And I have my phone. My phone doesn't turn on until seven in the morning. So I don't, uh, and I have a two hour maximum on every app on my phone and I don't keep email on it. So I've kind of tried to taper down the amount of time I spend staring at my phone. I spend, uh, hmm. I don't work during the summer. My kids uh, are with me all summer. So in previous years, I'd be like, all right, I get up at four or five in the morning and I work until my kids roll out of bed. And hey. this, this year, my goal is to not work all summer. Uh, I don't know how well that's going to go for me, but uh, I've been weaning myself off. So like I've used screen time and like deliberately reduced the amount of time that my phone will let me do anything. So it, it locks me out at 9 p.m. or after two hours of app usage, whatever comes first. Wow. Good for you for, for setting boundaries on yourself because, uh, you know, a great example, not having your email on your phone, that terrifies me. I mean, there's nothing, what do I, like, there are no telemarketing emergencies. I don't work in IT, right? So there's no, like, nobody's server has exploded. Nobody's business is down, right? Like, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> like, what can you know, happen I, that I need to, like, that I need to respond to like that? I get it. I do. I just, I don't know. When I, when I think of, when I think of, you know, I'm a, I'm a business owner, so I should, I should be able to check my email on a whim. I don't, but I should be able to. Um, I just don't have any emails that I, like, if there is so... I have a CEO now. Mm -hmm. I don't like I'm an owner operator now. I don't have to worry about the day to day stuff anymore. I work with a call center um, that's located in another state. And that call center is responsible for all the fulfillment. So if there's a problem, they'll handle it. If there's a sales problem, I've reached the point in my life now where if you can't wait one day to talk to somebody, I don't want you on my client roster. If you're the kind of person who's going to get all bitchy because you sent in a an email request to our uh, through our website and somebody took a whole day to get back to you, and instead of uh, waiting a day to hear from us, you went and worked with a competitor. Good luck to you, right? Like I don't need that, so I, I'm not on call to anyone anymore. No, that's that's good. So you said you have a CEO now. You you actually have two different companies, from what I can tell. You've got You've got managed sales pros still, mm -hmm. and then you've also got a new business. Can you, can you tell us about that? Yeah, I started a uh, consulting practice with my husband, Ian Richardson, uh, who owned an MSP, Doberman Technologies, up until December of last year. Mm -hmm. uh, he sold that business, and he is a certified Patterson Stratop facilitator, and he really, um, he really wasn't loving IT anymore, and I'm sure every... MSP owner gets to that point where they're like, oh, you know, I'm done with this. And he had the opportunity to pursue doing something that he loved. And that wasn't IT anymore. So okay. there was a lot of discussion around that, right? Uh, we've got a two entrepreneur, two entrepreneur household and both companies are doing relatively well. We're going to eliminate one entire income source and then we're going to start a whole new business from zero. It's kind of a scary proposition, right? Like I remember what starting a business was like. It was uh, 16 hour work days and lots of financial insecurity and, oh my God, are we going to be able to do this? And are we even, like this year, instead of doing that, we just pre-financed our lives and said, we're going to do this and we're going to spend a year getting ready, setting up our business. And we know that all of our expenses for the year are already covered, so we can take some risks. We can spend a little money having a professional website made from day one, right? Instead of like building the do it yourself and then, you know, three years later changing the website. So we invested heavily in our web presence from the very beginning. Uh, we obviously had the, having the managed sales pros database doesn't hurt us, but our goal is not to work in the IT channel exclusively. We want to go solve problems for other businesses. Like the IT channel has been great to both of us, and it's obviously the one we understand the best, but most MSPs have problems that are pretty much identical 
And I'd like to go start learning what other businesses are doing to solve their problems, you know? I like that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what, what you guys are going to be doing. Um, who are you going to be consulting for? Well, I mean, obviously our, our base is managed services business and mm -hmm. vendors. We work with managed service providers to help them set up strategic processes that will help them grow their business and ideally exit for a higher valuation. Obviously, we are not the only game in town. There's a lot of people getting into that space. M&A is very, very hot. Uh, but we also offer business coaching uh, for people that are looking to build their sales and marketing strategies in-house instead of paying a company like Managed Sales Pros to do it for them. Okay. So this sounds, uh, this sounds nice. It sounds expensive. It's Let's expensive. be honest. <laughs> but honestly, there's something I'd really like as a business owner and I, I guess I'm lucky, right? Everyone hates cold calling, so nobody yeah. wants to do it. So I never have a shortage of business and I really only need to sign you know, two pieces of business a month to stay at my current level, which I'm happy at, right? I, I know exactly how much business development it takes to get to that point. I have a process that I follow. So as long as I'm following that process, I know that managed sales pros will maintain its same level of profitability. Um, you know, assuming we don't lose all of our clients at once, we should be fine. <laughs> right? so, so that's kind of handled. And this other business, um, it's not scalable, right? It's my time. So if you want to work with me, there are a hundred other things I could be doing with that time. So I have to make sure that I'm charging enough that it's worth it for me because I could stay on the phone for eight hours a day for man of sales pros and make significantly more than I would make consulting for eight hours. So I'm going to, I want to spend a couple minutes, um, I, you know, I always sit and I, I wonder what's the best way to ask this question. I'm not going to do that with you. I know I won't offend you. Um, so a lot of, uh, it guys who are really great at it, they, they get sick of working for the man, right? All, all the bosses they've ever had are idiots. Uh, little do they know that <laughs> running a business sucks, right? You know, it's, it's hard. It, I mean, it, it doesn't suck. I mean, it can suck. If you have no idea what you're doing, uh, it is a difficult, you know, strenuous uphill task. And, you know, guys will look at a company like, you know, let's just talk about managed sales pros. Yep. The last I recall, uh, you guys were charging, let's say like six to $8,000 a month to do, um, cold calling for people and that's that, still accurate. Okay. So, so, you know, you think, uh, man, if, if they just get 10 clients, they're making 60 to $80,000 a month and they don't think about overhead. You know, they don't think about, you know, back in the day when you had payroll and employees, now you just, now you just pay the company that, that handles all that for you. But I, I suspect that's still a chunk, you know, it's, it's a sizable chunk. I don't care what the, the percentage is, you know, and you still have other business expenses, be it insurance, attorneys, et cetera. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and people you also have to hire three people for every one that lasts 90 days. So people don't really hire us because our telemarketers are amazing. They hire us because our telemarketers are at work every day and they mm -hmm. only make phone calls. That's it, right? There is no proposals to write. There's no other stuff. If your caller doesn't come in, this caller will be making your calls for you today. And since every project is pretty much the same, it doesn't affect us the way it would affect your company. If you hired a telemarketer, let's say, let's say you hired a telemarketer today, or let's say you wanted to hire a telemarketer internally today. Right? First, you'd have to find one. So let's say you run an ad and you get, now if you're lucky right now, let's say you get 50 applicants and you've never managed a telemarketer before because mm -hmm. that's most of our client base. And you don't understand that telemarketers that telemarketers that are thinking two career moves ahead went to work for Xerox and Cisco and other large uh, technology companies right out of college. Somebody recruited them from college, so they're all gone. You're not getting them. Right. You don't want your competitors, people, because if they are 
leaving their competitor, it's because they're not making money. Mm -hmm. People that are making money stay where they are. Right? So it's a high churn job. Our staff turns over 30 to 70% every year. That's insane. So we've got to hire constantly. We've got a constant bench of people coming in. I've got to hire three people for every one that lasts. So, so, so my point of all that though, is regardless of the industry, if it's a cold calling, you know, telemarketing company or an MSP or a doctor's office, starting your own business, there are going to be expenses. Um, and they, they could take up a, a large percentage of your revenue, no matter what point your business is at, whether you're bringing in you know, $1,500 of MRR or $150,000 of MRR, everything scales, not just well, the income. Everything except your margins, right? Like yeah. at you know, a million in revenue, you can maintain a 40 point margin. If, mm -hmm. I mean, let's assume that you're best in class and you've been really smart and strategic, but as your business scales, so will your expense, your expenses will scale disproportionately. Right? You're going to need middle management. You don't need that at a million. You're going to need sales reps and marketing people and all kinds of things. If you want to go from a million to five, your margins are not going to hold. So people have to be like, you got to get a little bit strategic and think like, what am I going to spend my money on? What's the best return on my investment? What am I best at? So mm -hmm. if you're best at technology, maybe you aren't the right person to be going to the networking events and so on and so forth, but you better learn quickly. Right. Like you're not the, the biggest mistake I see in the managed services market is guys with like three hundred or five hundred thousand dollars in annual recurring revenue paying outsourced companies six or eight thousand dollars a month to market for them. And it's like gambling. Like you have no and I'm I'm happy to say that publicly. It could fail. You could get nothing. Yeah. And so until you are prepared to spend seventy two thousand dollars with managed sales pros and be content at the fact that maybe you'll not close anything for seven or eight months, you're not ready to outsource. You cannot pay your marketing company with the money your marketing company makes you. They might not make you any. And that's a really good point. I mean, you, you can't just look at it as, um, I'm just going to pick the larger number of my range, $8,000 a month, right? Um, you actually have to say, I need to be willing to spend $96,000 for the next year on cold calling and understand that I may be throwing this money away if I don't close on any of the meetings that these guys get. Right. So if you're shitty at closing, when it, like I could send you all the deals in the world, if you can't close them, people measure us on closed deals, except that that's not my job. My job is to qualify and secure appointments. And if nobody wants to talk to you, I can't fix that, right? We aren't magic. Right. And, and that's, and that's a very important thing to think about is, um, you can, you can spend all the money in the world on, you know, marketing on, on building, uh, you know, a sales process, having, having a consulting company like Richardson and Richardson come in and help you develop all this fantastic, uh, processes and assessments and everything else. So that way you can go out and sell. But if you don't, if you don't learn how to close, it's all wasted money. Yeah. Well, I mean, close sales is a process. If you can teach an entry level help desk tech, how to troubleshoot a problem and make sure that they have the soft skills necessary to not piss off your client base, you can absolutely train an entry level telemarketer. You just need a process that they're going to follow. The other mistake I see is people bringing in sales talent when they've never managed sales talent before and expecting them to build the process that they're going to follow, which isn't what a sales rep does. That's a sales leader. And you absolutely can't afford one at a million in annual recurring revenue, right? Until you're making $3 million, you got no business hiring sales rep. You should be going on those meetings yourself. Okay. So let's, let's talk about this in stages then. Somebody who is getting their feet wet. We'll, we'll say that they're, you know, maybe they're at around a hundred thousand in revenue. Okay. What is the most important thing 
for that person to, to work on probably understanding how to find prospects and meet with them and close, right? Yeah, there are, I mean, there's so many ways to find customers at that base. So let's, let's assume you've got at a hundred thousand in annual revenue. What is that? How many seats are, would that be? How many clients have you got to manage? 50 endpoints probably. So it's just you at that point, right? Like oh, you're yeah. a one man shop. Uh, at that point, like joining a BNI group, but it has to be an owner BNI group, like not one where you're going to have to deal with all the people selling Nutra shakes and all that. Yeah, those content, things. Right? Yeah. Like, but BNI, like we had, um, we had an MS, like when we started men's sales pros, we weren't an MSP specific call center. We were just a cold calling company and we'd work with anybody. And then we went aggressively niche focused very quickly when we identified that most MSPs had challenges when it came to sales. Uh, but we, I belonged to a BNI group when we started our business and we had an MSP in that group and he was phenomenal at asking for referrals. And instead of saying, who do you know that needs IT support? He would say, who do you know that is? And then he would describe a situation where it would be ideal to change MSPs, right? Like, who do you know that's moving offices this year? Who do you know that's adding headcount? Who do you know that's whatever, right? So the ask was always about something specific, because I mean, off the top of my head, it's not like I go to parties and talk to my friends about who's going to change IT providers this year, but they probably would tell me at another event that they had just bought a new office building and they were going to move in 2022 or mm -hmm. other exciting things that are going on in their business. Oh, you know what? We're hiring 10 new people this year. Oh, well, it might be time to upgrade your IT support at that point. So that's an easier trigger for people. Like you can't put the burden of responsibility on everybody to bring referrals to you. You have to think of uh, active ways to help people remember when is it time to introduce me to those people. So going through LinkedIn, for example, at $100,000, finding people that you already know, maybe people you haven't talked to in five or 10 years and re-engaging with those people and going for coffee. Like one of the things Ian has done now that he's started the consulting practice is re-engaging with clients that he had for his IT company years ago. And you know, people that he spoke to, bids he never won, people he met at BNI, people he knows from the community. He's had like two or three coffees scheduled every day since he started his consulting practice just to get his name back out there because everyone knows him as this IT guy. Yeah. Now he wants people to know him as a strategic facilitator. So he has to go kind of reintroduce himself, talk to them about what he's doing, talk to them about you know, who do they know in conjunction together and what kind of business are they looking for? Because reciprocity is huge when it comes to referrals. So what's a good client look like for you? Here's what a good client looks like for me. Hey, let's like look at our LinkedIn profiles together and see who we want to meet. And then cross introducing people or cross pollinating. Right. So instead of just saying, trying to get people to bring referrals to you, Start thinking about how you can help them grow their businesses because nobody ever turns down a call from somebody who says, hey, I met this person at a networking event and they're looking for a new accountant. Would you like to have a cup of coffee? Then you give them the referral and you talk to them about how they're receiving IT support. Like if you can go into this with a go-giver mindset and instead of thinking like, how do I get new business for me? Think about how do I help the people around me grow their businesses? Everybody will take a referral phone call. Mm. I like that. So, all right. So that's the, the one person shop hundred thousand ish, give or take. Right. Um, I think that it's really, I just want to stress, you know, you mentioned BNI. Um, I really liked the BNI group I was in because I made really great friends, mm -hmm. but it didn't bring me really great business. And and the reason is because, like you said, I had the, the lady that sold, uh, essential oils. I had the, you know, well, I had the, I had the candle lady and, and I, you know, all, all that nonsense. And then I had a bunch of guys who did trades. Oh so, yeah. Great trades. Yeah. B and I is fantastic for roofers and guys that do pools and people that want ex expansions on the house and, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, new bathrooms. Um, it, it can be good for MSPs, for IT pros, if it, if it has like the right types of strategic people in the group, you know, you want to find like 
the web design company that doesn't also do IT or yeah. a print shop that doesn't also do IT, right? So find all these other strategic IT partners, uh, you know, find a good business attorney and, you know, that, that type of stuff. Make sure it's got a lot of uh, people in there that will actually help. And, and like Carrie said, you, you really need to, to focus on a BNI group that is all owners. If, if you just have people in there that are just sales reps, they don't care. No, I wouldn't say so well, sales they, reps, if you can kick back a little bit to the sales reps, I would yeah. always chummy. Uh, I would get chummy with the sales reps because they're the ones going out on the call. And maybe that isn't a good fit for them, but it might be a good fit for you. Mm. And you're right. But I guess what I'm saying is they have a quota. So <laughs> usually, right. Um, or, or maybe they're commission based. So they are more worried about putting, you know, food on their own table. Right? I would say at a hundred thousand dollars, you are also very worried about putting food on your own table at that point. <laughs> You're not wrong because at a hundred thousand dollars, you, you still aren't really a business owner. You're like uh, a freelancer. Right? Yeah, that's fair. And, and you guys uh, listening might, might go, well, what the heck's the difference? You know, the difference would be if, um, the differences between a guy who just happens to do websites versus a web design agency with multiple people. And well, one is a job, right? Like one you can't step away from. So if you're the only person that supports your clients, you don't have any option, but to make sure your phone's on all the time, right? Like if it's mostly a. I mean, it's a job until you can go away for a week and not answer your phone at all. It's very And true. that took me six. I could probably have done that sooner, honestly. Like, in retrospect, I, I could have walked away from my business sooner from the day-to-day -day stuff, but I was a bit of a control freak. So I didn't let go of the things that weren't in my genius zone fast enough. And 2020 was like, 2020 was the year where we did our, we went to our annual meeting. We were a traction shop and um, we did our SWOT analysis and they identified the biggest threat to the business. And that was me. Oh, yeah. Like, it's, uh, I mean, I respect my team for being able to say that to me, right? Like you know, you're not that interested anymore. You focus on things that aren't important. And I was like, they're important to me. And they're like, yeah, but they're not important. You don't finish your rocks on time. You're, the, you're like, and on and on and on. And I was like, all right. So I booked a full year long beach vacation. Like I was just going to go, I teach yoga um, for all inclusive resorts. And I've been doing this for like 12 years. So before I started um, and sales pros, I was a fitness instructor. So I had this whole thing set up. And I was supposed to start on March 16th, 2020. Mm. Yeah. So instead of doing any of that, I ended up having to sell my U.S. business because we couldn't staff effectively for the amount of business that we had. All of our MSP clients left and we like I had no problem with that. We called everybody. We're like, you want out of your contract? Now is the time. Right? Go now because I'm not coming in to work every day and firing one person at a time. Like, we're going to cut hard. We're going to cut fast. So everybody that wants to leave, go now. And all but two MSPs left. So half of my business gone overnight. And then vendors came in to take their place. But staffing, um, like our, our office was shut down by the Las Vegas government, right? We yeah. didn't have. And then the people that worked for us weren't able to work from home, right? Like we had $15 an hour employees, they don't have spare bedrooms and half of them didn't have credit ratings that allowed them to get internet. And actually it was really nice to watch everybody kind of come together when that happened. Wow. Um, we, we created little pods, like little work pods with people that live nearby each other. So if somebody didn't have internet, they could go work at someone else's house for the day and everyone followed COVID protocols. And like everybody really was just invested in making sure our business didn't fail. And it was one of the most challenging times of my life, but also one where I had the most faith in humanity. <laughs> so uh, we ended up having to, uh, we did an asset transaction of our US call center to one of our competitors. And I mean, that wasn't ideal, 
but it was what it was. And we had to start over again, like from zero in uh, October of 2020. So instead of going away for a year and letting my business uh, run itself, I had to sell my business and start from zero again. Mm. That, I mean, that's terrifying. And I mean, you know, I, I would say if it were anybody else, I think that would be a huge blow to the ego because they, I, I think a lot of business owners would see my business is failing, not there's a global pandemic that is causing me to have issues with my business. You know what I mean? Like pe sometimes people only see like the, the what's immediately surrounding me instead of the bigger picture. Well, we were ever, we will, we were able to find, so the company that bought my, they just bought my book, right? They didn't want anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had a U.S. business called Everywhere Managed. They bought the book from Everywhere Managed. Managed Sales Pros wasn't affected in the transaction at all. They didn't want Managed Sales Pros. They, Managed Sales Pros owned all the processes, scripts, and data. Everywhere Managed just had contracts. Hmm. So what they wanted was the revenue. They had lots of agents and they were dropping in revenue. We had lots of revenue and we didn't have enough agents. So hmm. it, was, um, it wasn't great for me because this company tried to buy our business several years previous. And I said, no. But in hindsight, I should have taken that deal because it was significantly better than the deal that I got when I had to like exit unplanned. Right. Uh, but I mean, financially, um, I had spent, I did the SBA Emerging Leaders Program, which gave me a great deal of financial literacy. And I also was a member of the Entrepreneurs Organization. And I had, um, there was a guy in my group who sat down with me. This was about a year and a half before the pandemic hit. Like financially, I wasn't, it was like, did we make payroll? That was like, that was all my, it's the only thing I cared about. I didn't look at anything else. And I really didn't understand my business. Like, were we profitable? Were we not profitable? And we'd never had to worry about it because we'd always done really well. And then we had like a scare where somebody put in 726 hours instead of 72.6 hours. And my bookkeeper called me and she said, you're going to miss payroll this month. I said, like, what are you talking about? Like, that's impossible. It's like, no, like your, your payroll is this. Here's how much you've got in the bank. You're not going to make it. You're going to have to move money into the business to cover your payroll. And I was like losing it. This would have been the payroll on our five year anniversary, right? Like we should be, we should be fine. So I'm like, I'm on the phone. I'm like, I'm going to close business today. I'm going to get some receivables in. I'm going to like, but we're not going to miss payroll. So it turned out that it was an accounting error. We weren't anywhere near missing payroll, but we were close enough to not having enough money in the bank that I was like, all right, I need to start thinking about this differently. And that's when I started talking to people, like asking, like, hey, how do I do this? Explain this to me. And somebody from my EO group met with me every Sunday and he made me bring every bank statement, every credit card statement, everything. And he went through all of them one item at a time. And I had to be accountable to him for every dime that I spent for like six months. And it absolutely changed how I ran my business. It changed what I spent money on. I was no longer coming into IT Nation four days early and staying four days late, right? I was like, no, we fly in on the day of and we fly out the day of and we take whatever shitty airline is cheapest. Like I just completely mm. changed how I spent my money and how I thought about it. So we, if we could have staffed, we would have survived the pandemic no problem. I had a prudent reserve. I had a year's worth of payroll in the bank. It would have been fine. but. What are you going to do? So what was that SBA thing that you said you did? It's the SBA Emerging Leaders Program. And it was fantastic. It's about, a, it's a big commitment. It's about a hundred hours of classroom work and then about a hundred hours of at home work. And then you, you would meet with a little group that they put you in every, um, every week. So there was a lot, there was a lot of work, but it was definitely worth the time invested in it just to learn how to like make your business profitable. Like I just never really thought about it. I was like, I was a fitness instructor. I started a telemarketing company and I started a telemarketing company because I was 22 weeks pregnant and didn't know what else I might do. Right. It, so I just started calling people like, Hey, do you need a telemarketer? Do you need your cold calling? Do you need a telemarketer? And somebody said, yes. 
And that's how my business started. So it's not like I got my MBA from Harvard and then thought, I'm going to start this lucrative managed services cold calling company. It was, you know, trial and error. And we grew really, really quickly. We were the 25th fastest growing company in Canada, our third year in business. And we moved into the U.S. that year as well. And so I was just like, I was this minimum wage kid who all of a sudden had this $2 million business. Kid. (laughs) I I could see how... You, uh, you probably really appreciated all of the, uh, you know, the emerging ladies leaders program. And then, um, where, how did you get that, uh, accountability person with the money? Was that part of emerging leaders? No, no, that was from the entrepreneurs organization, which, uh, is, um, an international entrepreneurs group. You have to have a million dollars in revenue to qualify, to belong to the entrepreneurs organization, but they also have an accelerator program. For companies that are smaller than that, that are, that, and you get mentors who are in EO that help you and guide you towards that million dollar qualifier so you can then join the EO program. And it's like having your own personal board of directors. So I had eight people in my, um, in my group. One of them was an MSP, which was really helpful, like learning the ins and outs of how an MSP actually ran, you know, versus my theoretical understanding from talking to MSPs. This guy was very, very forthcoming with the challenges that they faced and, you know, what life was like day to day. And it changed my perception of how I was selling to the managed services market. And it also, that was one of the way, reasons that we moved upstream instead of like, we don't work with anybody that has less than a million in revenue because I understand math now, right? Before it was like, got money, I'll work with you, no problem. But understanding how much a $6,000 a month commitment can damage a small business that isn't getting return on their investment for it like that just changed how I wanted to interact with business owners. I didn't want to be the reason that your business failed. Hmm. I, I really like that, Carrie. I, I love that, you know, first of all, you have incredible drive. Um, you, you seriously, I, I, I think a lot of people wish they had a fraction of your work ethic. Okay. Um, or at least the work ethic we think you have because of yeah, most of that was Tracy's work ethic <laughs> because of how awesome your business is. Right. You know, so, um, so that's one, um, two, I just love how much you actually care about your clients. Um, you know, I, I, you know, look, you're, you're sitting there, you're smoking a cigar, you're drinking what I assume is wine. No, no, it's you, water. I'm okay. Sober. Well, 18 years sober, no wine. Oh, that's I'm sorry. So, um, you know, you, but, but you're sitting there, you're, you're a total freaking boss, but you care. And I think that's make money and not be an asshole, right? Like that's at the end of the day, do I want people talking about how much money I made or do I want them talking about, you know, the great advice I gave them or like people will come back to us, right? Like it's, Mm -hmm. it's since I can't manage more than a couple of clients a month anyway, there isn't a lot of value in me burning leads and signing business that's going to turn over every 90 days. I want clients that are one, like comfortable spending the money, but who have also thought about the other ways they could spend that money, right? Like don't come to me as your first idea, like go and evaluate what else is out there. We lose a lot of business to other, like to competitive marketing agencies that aren't forthcoming about the fact that it could fail completely. And I want people coming into it, understanding that, you know, this is not magic. Mm -hmm. We're not, you know, like we got the same access to the same people that your company does, right? Like I can hire the same telemarketer that you can. We don't have magical telemarketers. We do have a pretty incredible process for building telemarketers. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of them. And I think that your process is your differentiator, right? Um, People are fallible, processes aren't. So it had to stop being, this was my marketing agency, right? It has to stop being the Carrie show. It can't be all about what Carrie does because if you ever want to sell this company, if you're not going with it, your company's worth nothing because everybody sees managed sales pros as Carrie. Yeah. So my goal, when we changed our, when we changed our brand a bit, we took a step back and looked at you know what we wanted and what we were going to do moving forward and if you look like it used to be my face all over the website and that's something we changed it isn't like 
come work with Carrie. It's like, hey, we're managed sales pros. Here's the process that we use for success. And if you follow this process, you will also be successful. Yeah, that's how you got to do it. That's how you got to do it. Carrie, thank you so much for coming on here. I, I learned so much. Uh, how do you want people to find you or reach you? Oh, you can find me at managedsalespros.com or at rnr.consulting. Uh, but don't find me until September because I'm not working. Good for you, Carrie. All right. Thanks so much. And Thank hopefully you. we'll have you back soon. Always a pleasure.